This is the amazingly tiny Amiga 600. This is its bigger brother, the Amiga 1200. And this is ridiculously small. So, plan is we're going to do a, a, a short-ish video on uh, this little uh, this little beauty, the the Amiga Mini. Look at the pros, look at the cons, and uh, well, let's just get into it, shall we? Yeah. So, firstly, let me just apologise for the uh, audio and visual quality not really being supersonic. I know if you go to someone like Downwood's channel, it's all very professional looking. But uh, that one of the reasons why I'm doing this is because uh, my missus is downstairs with her friend doing step aerobics. And it's something I don't want to witness with my own eyes. So I thought, you know what, sod it. I'll come up and do uh, something on this Amiga Mini instead because that might be useful to some people. So, um, yeah, this is rather sort of like hurried. Um there's no real script. There's no real direction. Um, some might suggest there's no real point, but there we go. So, uh, yeah, so apologies for the technical uh, aspects. It's not going to be as professional as some others. It's just, you know, you know, let's have a look at the machine. Let's see what it can do and um, discuss whether or not the damn thing's um, worth anyone's time, especially if you're um, one of these Amiga owners that, uh, you know, eats, sleeps and drinks Amiga. And you're probably looking at this thing going, oh, what the bloody hell do I need one of those for? So, uh, right, let's get into the machine. Here it is, all connected up. There's the controller. It's actually quite nice quality. Feels all right. It feels uh, the same quality of the original CD32 controller that was um, released for the CD32, obviously. Um, I've actually got this little treasure plugged in which works absolutely fine got it off amazon in fact actually got a pair of them uh use it with a laptop with win uae decided to try it with this machine and um it does actually work so that's nice you're not restricted to just this controller you can use something else and this one also has the same amount of buttons as as this one so that's useful um so yeah it's usb um c for the power in the back Next to that is the HDMI. And then next to that, you've got three USB sockets. And frankly, it uh, it really doesn't make any difference what you plug in where with regards to the USB because uh, the machine will pick up whether it's a mouse or whether or not it's a joypad or whether or not it's a USB stick. So that's nice. Um, so yeah, to uh, activate it, just hold the uh, power button for a couple of seconds on the back. Power LED will come on. And then you've got a short wait before something actually happens on screen. There we go. Doesn't that look lovely? I have noticed though on some big premium TVs, it's, it's almost as if it doesn't send the HDMI signal in a timely fashion. And sometimes it doesn't detect uh, the Amiga Mini. I found that I've had to go back out of HDMI source selection and go back in after it's already powered up and then it detects it fine but on some premium TVs whilst it's booting up before it actually sends the full signal the TV doesn't always pick it up this cheap crappy cello thing works absolutely fine um, and as you can see there there's the the uh, Wii homebrew inspired menu system so here we are having pressed the right button um i'm not going to go in too in depth with uh with what's on the home screen because plenty of other videos have have gone through it and uh obviously the, the camera quality here is uh pitiful frankly um you've got alien breed 3d alien breed special edition another world absolute classic arcade pool it's all right but couldn't they have got Arch McLean's pool? That would have been a better bet, wouldn't it? All-terrain racing, that's quite nice. Uh, Battle chess, well, yeah, I suppose. Cadaver, that's nice. California Games, eh, whatever. Chaos Engine, decent. Dragon's Breath, I think it's an alright game, but I, I'm really not sure this is the this is the kind of game that's going to get people to go, oh, wow, I've got to have that in my life. 
A flight simulator, F-16 combat pilot. Again, it's all right, but um, uh, that not working as a proper keyboard makes playing that a bit of an issue. Kickoff 2, well, there's lots of people that like it, and there's lots of people that prefer the other game. Lost Patrol, I, well, it's, it, it looks nice, it looks pretty. Um, I think people like it more for the, the music. I think that's the most iconic part of it, but whether or not it's got any kind of longevity, I don't know. Paradroid 90, well, it's, it's, it's awesome in its ST-ness, but it's still a decent game. Pinball Dreams, there's a no-brainer that one being on there really, that it really is a it is really is a classic game and it is one of the best of its type. Project X, well, it's one of those Team 7 games. You either like it or you hate it. Um I remember the original Project X, not the special edition, being ridiculously hard. I know the special edition is slightly easier and a bit more forgiving. It's alright. Um a Pidgey might have been a better better bet, but Project X is alright. Quack, well, it's, it's just a little, it's just a little platform game. But in all honesty, is anybody looking back at something like Quack with with fondness? Um, you know, is there not a million other games that you'd rather have rather than that one? Uh, the Sentinel, it's a classic. There's nothing else to say about that one. Simon the Sorcerer, awesome, really really nice. Speedball Two, uh, it's brilliant. It's as simple as that. Stunt Car Racer, awesome. Although for some reason. They've uh, neglected to uh, include a turbo mode, which is a bit of a... God, I even put my finger in front of the camera there. What an idiot. I told you it was going to be unprofessional. Uh, what else have we got on here? we got Supercars 2. That's all right. It's a bit of a laugh. Titus the Fox. I couldn't give a toss about Titus the Fox, quite frankly. They must have got this one on the cheap. Worms Director's Cut. It's all right. It's very good. Zool. I never liked Zool. I always hated Zool. And the reason why I hated Zool was because it was a pretty fast, smooth game. And it was supposed to be a Sonic beater. But when you play Sonic, um, other than a few little traps here and there, you can get some real speed up and go around fast loops and all the rest of it. Whereas in Zool, you've got enemies that respawn and it stop and kill and stop and kill and stop and kill and stop and you never ever get a chance to really move fast because there's always something to get in your way um it was never a, a sonic beta it was just a game that desperately needed a proper games designer to get involved with it all the flashy program in the world doesn't uh, doesn't hide that Another thing, it's it's only a minor gripe, but it's it's something I don't understand, and I'll, I'll show you now. Let's go and select Cadaver. Let's get it going. Oh, look at that! Straight into the game. Where, where's the intro? Huh? So let's go to uh, Pimble Dreams. Can't wait for that iconic music. Oh, what happened to that? Again, I don't understand why they've done it, but for, for some reason, for Cadaver and Pimble Dreams, they removed the uh, the intro sequence, which must have saved them ooh, all of 600k, which is, um, is, is kind of bizarre. All the intros for everything else appear to still be there, but not those two games, which I, I don't understand the logic of. You'll be pleased to know that should you plug in a USB thumb drive, it's hot swappable, you can plug and unplug, and it's not a problem. And there we go, there's the USB icon just down the bottom there between Titus the Fox and Worms. Although there is one thing I don't like about this. Um, it always appears in the same place, which seems fine, but if you're somewhere way over here, and you plug the USB stick in, it doesn't appear on screen round here as you would expect. You have to scroll all the way to the end of the games list to actually get to the USB thing, which I think is, oh, it's not very user friendly. I mean, it's only a minor gripe and maybe it's something they can update in a firmware update, assuming this thing's a success, which at the moment there's no reason to think it won't be it's just a minor gripe but it would be nice that when you plug a usb drive in 
it appears on screen in front of you or automatically scrolls directly to it. Because obviously if you've put in the USB thumb drive in there, you've put it in there for a reason and it's just a little bit irritating having to scroll to go and find it. So how easy is it uh, once you've put uh, games on the uh, USB stick? Well, it's dead easy. Um, never mind uh, all the other silly directory names. Um, if you look on the right hand side, you've got the A500 forward slash directory and you go on the Retro Games website, download a zip file, unzip it to a USB drive and then if you look there, those are LHA files. If you get nice and close, you can actually see it. Maybe not, because remember, we're not professional here. There we go. If I see it, you look like that. There we go. Um, they're LHA files. And I'm sure some of you out there are thinking, why don't they use ZIP? ZIP is like an industry standard. But, uh, as uh, some of you may not know, uh, ZIP doesn't preserve all Amiga file attributes, whereas LHA does. Um, and most of the, the guys that do the WHD load installs, they preserve the file names of the install unless they read it as a disk image and the files are read from there. Um, and some of the, the, uh, the file names um, are illegal or won't be loaded properly on a PC or zip will try and truncate the file names. Um, so this is why they use in uh, LHA um, so that all the files are preserved and you don't get any daft errors where the archiver has um, messed around with the file name and then WHD load then cannot load the file in question um, and then will then quit with an error. I mean, this is trying to be as seamless and um, user friendly as possible. So, you know, you literally don't have to do anything other than Go up to the file, and we're going to pick Pinball Dreams, mainly because uh, I happen to know the uh, the handsome guy that uh, did this particular WHD load install. Very handsome, very intelligent, um, but very unprofessional video equipment for something like this. And then you select it with the red A button, and if you look down the bottom, it is now selected that as a file. And then you click on the home button to start the game and it will all transparently. So there's a WHO splash screen. There's the name of the handsome guy there um, and Jeff, but the other guy's very handsome. I haven't got it turned up particularly loud, but this is the intro that's missing from the bundled version for, for reasons I can't possibly fathom. And then press a button. And then we're into the game proper. And it's that simple. And if you're bored of that, you can just press the home button, go back into the USB, and then uh, Turrican 2. Remember that current media is still selected Pinball Dream, so you then need to press the uh, red button, which now highlights Turrican 2 as the file then press the home button and then it will seamlessly load it up. Easy. This is as idiot proof as it gets. Here is the uh, game settings menu, which is uh, quite comprehensive. You can do width, height, stick on interlace, change from mouse to joystick. You can do immediate blitter. You can just wait for it like normal. 
you can do stuff with the copper, stuff with CPU just in time. You can even change this memory bar here. Let me just show you where you can change. Hang on a second, let me just go down to the right menu. Would be bloody useful, wouldn't it? Hmm? If you look there, you can change the different configurations of memory, which which is, is pretty good for those that uh, want to, because this is basically for those when you're adding WHD load stuff on the USB thumbstick. Obviously, it assumes that you've got a bit of Amiga knowledge that you're not a complete novice. However, there's one thing I don't quite understand with the memory on this thing. Um, because it says two megabyte chip, eight megabyte of fast memory, which is fine. But WHD load supports quite a lot of games. One of those games is Beneath a Steel Sky CD32 version, which compressed tops out around about 63 megabyte. Um, you'll be interested to know that it does actually work on the Amiga Mini. However, you can be waiting at least three minutes for it to actually load the game up. I started loading, the combination of the uh, the, the red LED was on and the, the green uh, drive light was constantly flashing, um, and I left it. And I got back on with what I was doing on the laptop. And then all of a sudden I heard this music come out of nowhere. And then it actually start beneath a steel sky um, on the Amiga Mini. Now, it, this, is, this is great news because it, it means that if we want to in the future, uh, those that are inclined to do so, we could rip 16-bit CD audio reconvert it to 8-bit and we could actually have it where a CD32 version has the music that was intended when it was released working on the Amiga Mini. However, the fact that other than the green LED was flashing on the Amiga Mini, I had actually no idea whether or not the thing was working or whether or not it had crashed. Um, and there was no kind of progress bar or any kind of hint as to how long it was going to take. Now, I appreciate that Beneath a Steel Sky CD32 is a bit of a, an outlier, um, but for at least three minutes, the screen was black, and I didn't really have a clue what was going on. And with these memory configuration, it, uh, it perhaps shouldn't have even loaded at all. So I'm not quite sure how it's, um, it's getting around that, unless... Um, the files it can't preload into memory, it's loading them on demand and it's loading them fast enough where you can't see the regular OS flashing that you would normally see. Um, I like to know how they're getting around that, but also it would be nice for some kind of indication on screen that the Amiga Mini is basically chewing through the information it's being given and it will be with us at some point um, once it's finished unpacking everything. Now, I don't want to make it sound as if I'm being overly critical about these WHD load um, issues. And they are only slight issues. But the Amiga Mini has um, a, a place in the market and it has a point. It's not meant for the Amiga owner that is still using Amigas, maybe uses a, an 030 with lots of fast mem, knows everything there is to know about the Amiga. The Amiga Mini is for somebody who used to own an Amiga back in the 80s and 90s. Their experience is knowing how to put a disc in the internal drive and how to use Xcopy, and that was pretty much it. Um, the Amiga Mini is meant for those kind of people that want to relive some of the experiences that they remember from when they were kids. Um it's not meant for the the power emulator user that uses their Amiga for lots of different things. It's meant to be small, it's meant to be compact, and it's meant to be accessible. Um, and obviously the Amiga Mini is trying to copy 
um, the format of things like the PlayStation Mini and the SNES Mini um, by having it as easy to use as possible, which is why it's important that this WHD load stuff has got to work um, and not just work. Let the end user know what's going on, having progress bars, um, that kind of thing. Um, because let's not forget that the Amiga was a proper computer. Um, but they're kind of treating it like a console, which is fine. Um, that's why they're using WHD load. There's no disk swapping to do. There's no configuration to worry about because the install, the WHD law, it load install handles all of that stuff. So that the end user doesn't have to fart around with that at all. Um, Currently, the Amiga Mini doesn't support ADF files, and I know quite a few people are going to be disappointed with that, um, and many people that have got other alternatives to the Amiga Mini um, would dismiss it by not being able to use ADFs, and which I, I fully understand that. It would be nice if in the near future they um, added um, a new firmware to give people that option if they want to go that complicated where they may have to set up some options to get stuff to work. Um, from what I can understand, when it comes to um, firmware updates, it's as easy as literally downloading a file off the Retrograins uh, website, copying it onto the thumb drive, plugging it in, the machine will automatically detect it and then install it. Um, and copy it into NAND memory on the machine, and there we go. So hopefully in the future um, that will be added. But I will say I don't really think that would be the end of the world if you couldn't, because let's face it, when, when it comes to WHD load, the majority of the most popular games have all been installed. Um, the most popular demos have been installed. Yes, there's going to be stuff that's missed, but there's no issue with people asking whether some of these WHD load um, slave authors are able to um, quickly knock up a slave so that their favourite intro or demo that hasn't currently been supported can be supported. Um, but my my view on the Amiga Mini is is I quite like it. I like the fact that it's small. I like the fact that it can sit on top of the PS4. Um, I don't have to find... I don't have to struggle to power it up. It can just... Uh, well, currently, what I do is I actually plug it into the, um, the the wireless transmitter. It's got a spare USB socket, and I just plug it into that, and, and away it goes. Um, if I just want to have a quick session on the Amiga where I don't have to plug the laptop into the big TV or any da anything daft like that. Well, the Amiga Mini does it. It doesn't take up too much room, so even the missus can't get pissy about it. It can sit on top of the PS4, and at any time that I want to, if I want to, you know, play something classic, within a, within a minute or so, I can be doing so. Um, and that would be the same for, you know, people that... Um, because primarily this, this machine is aimed at those that used to have an Amiga, no longer do, or can no longer justify the room that an Amiga would take up. Um, but maybe for Father's Day or a birthday or what have you, you know, they may be off offered the opportunity to have one of these machines. And I think it's perfectly adequate at the job. Is it the most powerful system? Nope, not remotely the most powerful system. But everything that I've thrown at it so far, it's been able to do the job. I've not played anything so far and thought, oh dear, that's not as good as I, as the original Amiga would have been able to do it. I mean, let's be honest, this tiny little uh, thing that costs £112 is more powerful than any Amiga that was ever released officially by Commodore, um, which shows you how far things have um, have moved on. The machine has some quirks and foibles, which I've already mentioned. Some, mostly, they're mo mostly minor uh, quibbles, really. 
which a, a firmware update could um, could certainly fix and make the user's experience a little bit better. Um, I don't understand why the intros over a couple of the games are removed. Um, some of the games that are on the machine, uh, they are of, a, of no value whatsoever. They are literally the kind of things that people will look at and go, oh, yeah, and then move on to something else. Um, it's a shame that there isn't a bit more representation by the likes of Psygnosis on there. I mean, I can't complain about the Bitmap Brothers stuff being on there, that, that you know, even when they were doing ST ports, their games were still playable and their, their games were still brilliant. Um, but it would have been nice to have a bit more, a bit more variety. Um, but, but I would say the majority of the games that are on the system are, are, are good enough. There's a few that just really shouldn't be on there. Um, but I think mainly because of the fact it is so easy to add WHD load installed games onto the system. I'm guessing that uh, the makers of the machine felt that putting too much effort into the games that were already installed on the machine was possibly a wasted effort on their part, whilst they couldn't perhaps get an official license for maybe something like cannon fodder. Well, there's nothing to stop the user from just sticking that on there themselves. In conclusion, I like the system. I think it has a market. I think it has an appeal. If you're one of these people that owns one of these high-powered multi-system emulators, in all honesty, it's probably not for you. Um, and the kind of machine that you're used to, uh, you know, being able to tinker around with configuration um, and all the rest of it, it's not really aimed at people like you, um, who know where they can go download the games, know how to get them working. This is very much aimed at the novice Amiga user who has never used an Amiga or literally just put discs into it and nothing else and played games but didn't actually use it as a computer. It was only a games machine as far as they were concerned. It's aimed at those people. It's aimed at idiot-proof here we go, you've got a game working. Um, the fact that you can expand it and add a USB keyboard and things like that, frankly, that that doesn't interest me in the slightest. Platform games, um, shoot 'em ups that kind of stuff, perfect. But if I want to get, you know, in into more involved gaming, well, I've got uh, an old Windows laptop with a built-in keyboard and a screen and it turns on really quick and within two minutes I can be playing something. For the complicated Amiga stuff, yes, you can do it with the Amiga Mini, but in all honesty, you, you probably wouldn't want to bother. It's an accessible machine for accessible games for the novice user. Um, it's, I don't know, whether or not you think £112 is expensive or not, well, that's, that's down to the individual people. I've seen it... Um, I've heard that Amazon have given out vouchers and have reduced it by a couple of quid more. Um, I don't know, for 112 quid, if I got this for my birthday or for Father's Day or something, I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be gutted, and it would probably, um, probably get use as well. So, yes, it does have a few little teething problems, but in the main, it works. It works very well. It's easy to add software. The games that come with it are okay, and some are excellent. Um, but yeah, I I recommend the system. I think it's I think it's all right. And obviously, if this machine is a success, then there's the possibility of them doing a a full size version. Um, I, I still don't know whether or not I'd want something like that for the sole reason is I've got an Amiga five hundred. I've got an Amiga 600, I've got a 1200, and I've got an A4000 somewhere, which I seem to have lost. Um, but I don't have the room to even set up one of those, which is why I end up using the laptop so much. 
So whilst an Amiga Maxi, if that's what they want to call it, might appeal to some, doesn't really really appeal to me because I don't have the space to to have an Amiga 500 full size set up anyway. Um, whereas the Amiga Mini can sit on top of the PS4, takes up virtually no room, is out of the way, and it, it can be you know button press and away you go. So yeah, I do like the machine. It's going to get some use. Um, and that's it. That's all I've got to say, really. And uh, yeah, apologies for the absolutely piss poor video um, and audio. But um, yeah, the missus decided to go on a keep fit thing. And I was exceptionally bored. And I thought, why not do this? Um, so yeah, thanks for, thanks for watching. And um, uh, maybe seeing another one. But a bit more professionally done, maybe. Probably not.